Hello YouTube, and welcome to this ultimate quad exercises tier list. As the name indicates, today we're going to be focusing on exercises that develop the upper leg. But because it's impossible to isolate that part of the body in particular, and maybe even counterproductive, I will of course also mention the muscles of the glutes, the hips, and the posterior chain. But please don't confuse this episode with a posterior chain episode. The lifts we're going to review today are not the best ones for arm strings because the arm string exercise still list has already been produced. It is actually in the description for you guys along with all of the other muscle groups I've already covered. We have done lats, traps, shoulders, triceps, biceps, you name it. We are at the end of the series. So if there are exercises that you have missed, you are in luck because every single episode is already waiting for you in the description. So since today's episode focuses on the quads, you'll also naturally understand that a lot of the lifts that I will be reviewing are going to be knee flexions. We separate knee flexions and hip hinges for a reason. It's because the best quad exercise by default can never be the best armstring exercise. And this means that there's going to be a ton of squats in today's review. But we're not going to be limiting ourselves to just that movement pattern because even though the squat is the king of quad development, there are also other types of exotic variations and leg movements that you should be considering into your leg training as well. That being said, if there is a squat pattern that is good or bad for bodybuilding, it will be covered today. My goal is to make sure that if there is something out there that is great, you hear about it and you start doing it. And if there's something out there that is actually bad, but people push as a gimmick, I warn you against it. And we can therefore together navigate towards finding the best of the best lifts out there. The reason why I didn't want to limit myself to squats is because one, it would be boring. And two, there are certain isolation movements that are extremely beneficial for leg development because they can help you target certain areas of the quads and they're not going to fatigue the entire body. Yes, big compounds are great for hypertrophy, but sometimes you need some precision. And now that this has been established, we can take a look at today's tiers. So the D tier for today, I named the chicken tier. Why? Because in the realm of fitness and bodybuilding, when someone has small legs, we call him chicken legs. Even though chickens don't have small upper legs, it sticks. The name is funny. And so I'm going to keep using it. In the T tier will be all of the exercises that you just need to dodge. They're not even worth considering for one second. They should not even be called quad exercises. They suck. Then in the mediocre tier are movements that some people came up with because they had good intentions. But at the end of the day, they're also mostly a waste of time. They have some issues with balance. They're going to be tough to overload. They can be injury prone. They are hybrids in nature. They attempt to do everything at once. So they try to be a posterior chain exercise and a quad exercise. And as I said, this fails miserably also avoid these exercises. Then we have our B tier, the decent tier. And the decent tier are exercises that are good that you might want to start with when you're not super balanced or good with squats or compound movements, but you will quickly outgrow them. And then we get into the very interesting tiers, the one that contain the lifts that I personally recommend, the A tier and the S tier. Our A tier is the excellent tier. These are very good movements, time tested, that you can use in your program 100%. But they lack that little oomph. They lack that mystical thing, that little characteristic that would propel them into the God tier. And for today's God tier, I could not go without naming it after the quad fighter himself, Tom Platz, which is why the S tier is the Platz tier. I understand that, yes, he was on steroids. Yes, he was deeply controversial because he would train legs once every 15 days. But at the end of the day, he's a legend for a reason. He had the best pair of legs in the history of bodybuilding and his mindset in particular is still legendary to this day. So I decided that it was only natural to name the God tier after him. And now that this has been established, we can start with the tier list proper. And we're going to begin with a lift that needs to be discussed right away so that you can compare every single other squat variation to it. I know where I stand and that is the high bar squat. So. For some people, the high bar squat is the best thing that has ever existed. It's the only thing you need if you want to get big legs. Just spam squats and you'll be good. And then you'll have people, especially in the past 10 years, who have come out of the woodwork to say, hey, 
high bar squats are actually not that good. There are much better options out there. And actually, in terms of compounds, you might want to dodge them altogether and replace them in your program. I'm personally in the middle, but because of my love for the movement and because, well, that's how I got my big legs, I'm much more inclined to believe that, yes, high bar squats have a legendary status for a reason. It's because they do work. It's a compound movement that is time tested. So I'm going to be placing the high bar squats in the excellent tier. It cannot be put into the S tier because it is true that for a lot of people, you're still going to recruit a ton of lower back, a ton of hips. The amount of knee flexion of knee traveling forward is going to be reduced by your ankle mobility. So it's a great overall leg builder. And yes, you can build big quads off of it, but we can do better. And the fix is actually quite easy. You just have to elevate your heel. So either you get yourself a pair of Olympic squat shoes, which I personally own and they're a great addition to your arsenal, or you grab a plate, small plate, and you put them underneath your heel and just like that, it's fixed. That way you're going to be able to keep a much more vertical torso. You're going to be able to keep your knees in line with your toes to track them forward and to recruit more quads. The fix is not that hard. And once that is done, you can actually put that directly into the S tier. Heel elevated squats are plats tier. You will also be humbled because you will find that since you cannot hip hinge into the movement, you cannot recruit as much arm strings, glutes, and lower back. And so you are going to have to cut the weight that you use maybe by 20 or 30%. Some people grimace at this notion because they like to lift heavy, understand that the quad development is what we care about. If you lift less weight, but you get better stimulus, it's a win in my book. But I would still always personally recommend people learn how to squat with a barbell normally before they do that, because to know how to utilize this ill elevation takes some skill and some proprioception, meaning that your, your ability to actually move your body through space and perceive your body through space. But the one thing that I do not want to see beginners do is the following. It's to use the Smith machine. When I started training 10 years ago in the gym, times and times again, beginners and noobs were directed towards the Smith machine because apparently it was an easier way to learn how to squat. That is complete fucking bogus. You cannot cannot learn how to high bar squat on the Smith machine because the number one component that you need to learn on the high bar squat is balance and it's the neurological adaptation that occurs when you try to gain that balance as you go down with the weight on your back. The Smith machine negates that aspect. The only thing you're going to be able to do on this is you're going to learn the pattern wrong and then when you move on to the free bar, you're going to be a mess. So if you approach the Smith machine thinking I'm going to use it to high bar, just the way I would with a barbell, it's D tier. However, if you approach it with the proper mindset and you use the advantages of the Smith machine, aka the removal of the balance aspect, then it becomes S tier. Yes, you heard me right. Smith machine squats are plat tier. Why? Because if you are experienced and you know what you're doing, you're going to be able to put your feet way in front with the bar resting on your traps, and you're going to be able to track the knees forward and get a ton of quad stretch, which is absolutely impossible with free weight, because if you attempted that, your center of gravity would be tilted backwards and you would fall on your butt. But because of the Smith machine, you can push up and down without having to balance the weight because the weight is held by the rack. That is the beauty of it. Again, I think that People who have some experience with free weight squats will best benefit from it, which is why, unlike what some people think, the Smith machine is not for beginners. It is for intermediates and advanced lifters. The ability that the Smith machine gives you to keep your torso vertical plus the balance aspect makes it so that you really should not be underestimating this piece of equipment. But if you are a noob and you want to ease your way into squats, what should you do? Well, there are what I call beginner squats. And these are things, for example, like your Hindu squats, your bodyweight squats, your Slav squats to learn depth, your wall sits to learn tension in the quad. All of these things are lifts that I would only call introductionary lifts because they are going to ease you into proper compound movements to grow your quads. So I'm going to put them in the C tier because you should quickly outgrow them. Body weight movements at some point for the legs become impossible unless you are willing to do thousands of Hindu squats a day, at which point I ask, 
why not just put weight on your back? It would be so much easier. And when it comes to loading your squats for the first time, the goblet squat is a great option. You load the weight in front of you, so it forces you to keep a very vertical torso. It forces you to track the knees forward. It is a great option. It is how I learned how to squat. But once again, this quickly becomes irrelevant because once you start to do your reps with 120, 130, you quickly realize that getting in position with the dumbbell is harder than doing the reps. So you need to move on to something better. But I'm still going to put some respect on the goblet squat for all it has done for us as beginner lifters, and I'm going to put it in the decent tier. And you might want to hack the system and think, okay, well, I can't load the goblet squat, but what if I do it with a landmine? Now I can put as much weight as I want on it. First off, wrong, because the plates are where you're going to put your hand, so you're going to be limited. And two, your hands are still going to have to be in that upward position to catch the weight, so you're still going to be limited by the front rack position. So I'm also going to put the landmine uh, front squat, quote-unquote, in the descent tier. It is not a good variation and not a good idea. So what should you be doing instead? Well, I think that the answer is obvious. You want to have the weight in front of you. There is a lift named after that. It's called a front squat. And the front squat goes into the excellent tier. It is my favorite variation of squat of all times. It is beautiful. I love the way it feels. And yet, I also cannot put it in the S tier because I have to recognize that there are some pretty blatant issues with the lift. Like, for example, the fact that the front rack position is hard. The technical aspect of it is demanding. It demands a ton of work, of wrist flexibility. All of that for a lift that, yes, keeps you vertical, but could be replaced by something else. And you'll see that there are other variations that take zero technical work that you can do. So if you have a front rack position in your sport, you're an Olympic weight lifter, do front squats, no problem. If you love the lift, like I love the lift, do front squats, no problem, but it is simply not S tier. On the completely opposite side of the spectrum, there is actually a machine that gives you all of the same benefits, meaning that it doesn't load your lumbar spine that much. It allows to really focus on the quads and it takes zero technical skill whatsoever. And that is the belt squat. Now, when it comes to belt squatting, there are two scores. There's the ghetto score and there's the rich people score. The ghetto score is you don't have the money for it or your gym doesn't have a belt squat. So what you do is you're going to rig up one yourself. This implies that you're going to be standing on a platform, two platforms actually, because logically the weight will be dangling from your waist, so it needs somewhere to go. So you're going to climb up something with weight dangling from your waist. It's fairly dangerous. You're going to have to balance yourself and then you're going to have to squat in the hole that you created. Question being, what happens if you go to failure? I'll tell you what happens. If you're lucky, you get off and you dismount safely. If you're unlucky, you're going to hurt yourself or you're going to look really, really dumb. So this is actually not something I recommend on top of that because you're going to have to take a wide stance to have space for the weight to go into and for your body to go into as you squat down. You're going to, for the most part, externally rotate at the hips. So you're not going to travel forward with the quads. You're not going to target the quads that much. It's going to be a lot of glutes, a lot of arm strength, a lot of adductors. It's actually not a belt squat. What you're doing, it's a completely different lift. If you like the feeling and if you want to make it safe and make it loadable, I actually have another lift that is going to come later in the tier list that is much better and we're going to discuss it later. That type of belt squat I would put in the B tier. The actual belt squat with the, with the machine I put in the S tier because it is a beautiful way to destroy your quads without anything else interfering. Issue being, of course, that it's rare. Many gyms don't have a belt squat. And it's expensive as fuck if you buy it for yourself. But if you own one, you know what I'm talking about. Now, you can still fuck it up. And actually, the majority of people fuck it up. Because I look at some lifters on Instagram, on YouTube, who belt squat. And they replicate the same uh, form mistakes and the form cues that they would if they didn't have a belt squat machine. Meaning that they're going to take a very wide stance with toes pointed outward and are going to really lean into it and have an almost tilted torso. But the belt squat machine was created to allow for a vertical torso and to allow for forward knee travel. There is a reason why the weights are outside. It's to give you space for your knees to travel forward. So if you do your belt squats, please, for the love of God, do it with a closed stance, a vertical torso, and you initiate the movement by pushing your knees forward as much as possible. That is how you do your proper belt squats. If you do them like this, it is absolutely plat tier.
Now, what could be the exact opposite of that machine? What could be a leg machine that puts you in a very uncomfortable situation and one at that that is going to put a ton of pressure on the lumbar spine for no benefits whatsoever? Well, ask no further because someone actually created that monstrosity and it's called the vertical leg press. So now we're going to go on to the leg press section because not all leg presses are born equal. Some of them suck, like the vertical one, and some of them are great. The vertical one sucks because who on earth wants to be in that position when they push legs hard? You're going to have a tendency on top of that to round your pelvis to get your glutes to assist, which can be very dangerous for your lower back. Your knees are going to run into your chest. Overall, there is no reason whatsoever to use that type of leg press to train your legs. And for that reason, I'm going to be placing this vertical leg press in the chicken tier. It's our first entry in the D tier. And the next one is not that much better. So it's both a type of leg press and a type of exercise I see people do on the leg press. And that is the unilateral press. You do it with only one leg. Why do I dislike the movement? The first reason being that the machines made specially for the movement tend to be poorly designed. So the pad that you're supposed to press with your leg is very far away. You never get the full stretch because the leg never fully actually travels backwards. And the other one is because if you attempt to do the movement on a normal leg press, well, now you're off center. You're going to have to shift your pelvis to get that one leg in the middle of the, the, the pressing pad, because if you don't, it's not going to be equally distributed. So overall, it's a bad idea. There are much better ways to train your legs one at a time. So this one is going to go into the mediocre tier. If you're going to use a leg press to train, don't go fancy. Just use the regular classical variation, the hangout leg press, while you sit, you have the safeties on the side, it's perfectly good, the range of motion, yes, is a bit limited, but you can still get big legs off of it. That being said, I'm not a big fan. I'm only going to put it in the decent tier. Not because it's a bad lift, but because there are other variations of the very same machine that, to me, blow it out of the water. And one of them might surprise you because, again, some people think it's for noobs, it's the seated leg press. So instead of having the pad ahead of you and in front, so looking up at it, it's going to be in front of you directly. So now your hips are not angled upwards, they just sit naturally where they are, and what does the movement, what does the travel motion is the knee. And that tends to recruit more quads, and you get much less glute emphasis and glute recruitment in that specific type of leg press. I also find that the seat moving back and forth is very natural and feels very good as opposed to pressing the thing away from you. The only problem being that because these machines are manufactured for noobs, I guess, a lot of the times they don't go that high in weight. Most of the ones I've seen in gyms go up to 200 pounds. And even someone like me can max out these machines for reps of 25 extremely quickly. So until someone comes up with one that goes up to five, 600 pounds, which is the weight you should be using if you're going to train your legs, the legs are extremely strong, I cannot put them higher than the excellent tier. So if the regular leg press is only decent and the uh, variation where you're sitting and pushing uh, away from the machine and from the pad is excellent, what could be Platt's tier? Is there a type of leg press that maybe corrects all of these mistakes? Well, actually, yes, there is. And it doesn't really have a name. I nicknamed it the pendulum leg press because it's what it does. But if you're looking for a reference, Technogym, the company Technogym actually sells a leg press that replicates exactly the qualities of the pendulum. So instead of the weight being attached to the pad you're going to press, they are attached to a lever that sits underneath the machine and moves as a pendulum, so in dimension of a pendulum. And that corrects the strength curve, it corrects the filling of the pad when you press, because you just don't press back and forth, you actually feel the resistance underneath you, and overall, it is just beautiful. It is the Rolls Royces of leg presses, to the point that if you train with this variation, you will never be able to go back to the regular one because it will feel like absolute trash. Unfortunately, it's super rare and it's super expensive. So I'm going to put it in the Platts tier because it is really that good, but I'm really just making you guys salivate over something that you might never get to experience. So instead, here are some lifts that anyone can do with almost no equipment, even if you have a home gym, even if you don't have access to machines. The first one is a lying leg extension that is just an extension with an elastic band. Of course, I'm going to put it in the chicken tier. It's impossible to overload. 
There's no real stretch or negative. It's something you can do for warm ups and maybe to rehab if something bad happens to your knee. But beyond that, it's completely useless. The walking lunge, however, can be used, but I still have my problem with it. Because in the grand family of single leg movements, I think that this one is the worst for multitudes of reasons. The first one being that you might be limited by cardio. Two, it's a dynamic motion. So your reps are not going to be the same. One stride could be longer than the other, etc. And also your grip might be the, the limiting factor unless you're using straps. Since there are much better variations of the lunge out there, this one cannot go higher than the mediocre tier. The normal regular lunge, however, is much better for the simple reason that you're not walking, you're static. And stability, balance, and consistency of repetitions tends to be much better for bodybuilding. So the normal regular lunge I'm putting in the decent tier. Now we're going to talk about the split squat. And to make sure that you guys are not confused, because I know that they're in the same family and they're actually the exact same movement, but the characteristics differ. I'm going to tell you in like five seconds how to tell the difference between the four lifts that I'm going to be talking about right now. So the walking lunge is a movement that has you move forward. So it's a dynamic movement. The regular lunge is the same motion. You are standing in the same spot, but you still alternate between each leg. So there is still motion in the hip and motion in the feet, more importantly. A split squat is the exact same thing, except that there is no movement of the feet. You never bring the feet back to shift. It's always the same leg and you train the same leg. And then there is the Bulgarian split squat, which is a normal split squat, but the back leg is elevated. That's it. It's as simple as this. And for the reasons I just explained, you also understand why the walking lunge is the worst, the lunge is the second worst, and then the split squat is going to go into the A tier. It's static, the same repetitions, but you lack the extra stretch that you would get with the Bulgarian variation. I also find that people have a tendency on split squats to actually bump down knee, the knee of the back leg of the floor to cheat the movement and get it back up. It's like people who bounce the weight of their chest on bench press, but now you do it with your knee, which unless you have a fetish for bruised joints is not a good idea at all. So what you do instead is you elevate that back leg and just like that, you also cannot push off of it that much. And since in bodybuilding, we always want to make the most out of the least weight, this is a good thing. You will find that the amount of weight you can use on Bulgarian split squats is much reduced compared to the split squat variation because the back leg is taken out of the equation. Now it only exists as a way to anchor yourself and to balance yourself. So I'm placing the Bulgarian split squat in the Platz tier. It is a monstrous movement. It is ridiculously hard. The amount of intensity you can put into it is crazy. It is going to destroy your glutes. It's going to destroy your quads. To the point that I've actually developed a way to tell whether someone does their Bogan split squats properly or not without even having to look at a single video of their form. You just have to ask them, hey, are Bogan split squats difficult? If someone tells you no, it's because they cut the range of motion down or they have no tempo. So they just go up and down, up and down with no negative whatsoever. This should be the lift that you hate the most on your program. You should dread doing that movement. It should be a torture. If it's not painful, you're not doing them properly. I would rather do a 10 by 10 of post bar high squats rather than three sets of 10 of Bulgarian split squats. That is how much I fucking hate them. And yet I still include them in my program because they are truly that good. Oh, and just as an aside, unlike the guy in the little miniature I used for the illustration for Bogan Split Squats, I recommend you do them with dumbbells in your hands. It's not going to limit range of motion that much. Doing them with a barbell will lead to a tendency to lean forward, which turns the movement into more of a hip hinge. And you also don't really want to have to balance weight on your back. It's already hard enough to balance as is with dumbbells in your hands. So stick to dumbbells. Now, what other types of unilateral leg movements can we discuss? Well, there's the step-ups. The step-ups is a favorite of athletes, which also makes it bad for hypertrophy because the degree of knee flexion is limited and there is absolutely no negative because you're just going to step down after your step up. So I'm putting it in the chicken tier. Maybe it's good for explosivity. I don't know. I only care about size. Then we have explosive squats. So just like with beginner squats, in explosive squats, I put things like half squats or jump squats. 
That also is not that good for hypertrophy, like jumping up a box or doing like half squats for developing your verticals with a barbell. If you're an athlete, okay, maybe you can consider it. I'm going to put it in the mediocre tier. But maybe you're the type of person that likes to impress others, in which case, yes, jumping on a ton of 45 pound plates that you selfishly stole from the other patrons of the gym just to impress your gym crush is a great idea. That way you can also slip and just destroy your nose in front of her and lose any chance at actually getting together with her. But if you crave people's attention, you could also give shrimp squats a shot. A shrimp squat is a single leg variation that has you bend over like a shrimp and hold the back leg. It looks absolutely ridiculous. The back leg is going to run into the floor because your knee is going to limit your range of motion. It is not a good exercise at all, but apparently it impresses some people. If you are so out of party tricks that you have to resort to imitating a shrimp, I think that you need to reconsider your life. So I'm putting the shrimp squat in the mediocre tier. The pistol squat is in the same ball game, but at least there's a ton of range of motion. My issue with the movement is that it's extremely hard to slow down the negative because you're relying on only one leg. You could actually injure the tendons of your knees if you are not careful. Calisthenic guys swore by it and if I had a dollar for every single time a calisthenic guy told me that you can get big legs with pistol squats, I would be a millionaire and they would still have small legs because it is really not that great of a leg builder. Still going to put it in decent tier, you can load it with a kettlebell. But if you're going to train with single leg stuff, why not just do Borgen split squats that are much more effective and they take almost no skill and much less balance, that is for sure. Now, we're going to talk about a lift that has a bad reputation because it is touted as a knee destroyer and people say that it does nothing. And that is the CC squat. I think that the name doesn't help the cause of the lift. But I'm going to judge it fairly because to me, it is actually an excellent tier. I'm going to put it in the A tier. As long as you are rigorous about your form and you actually go through a slow negative, it can also be extremely safe. I recommend you start with a bend to habituate yourself, but it's a good way to stretch the quads. And the good thing about the lift is that if we're talking isolation of the quads without a machine and with body weight, this is as close as it gets. You're not going to tax your glutes because they're completely out of the movement. You're not going to tax your hips. You're not going to tax the adductors. It's going to be pure quads. So if your knees can take it, you can load it slowly and it can become your best friend. It doesn't go into the plat tier, however, because if we're talking stretch of the quads, there is one variation that has them all beat, and that is the plat squat. It's literally named after pump plats. And it's a type of high bar squats, and I insist on high bar because you're supposed to stay extremely vertical, that has you do a very close stance with toes pointed forward and with your heels elevated by plates or by these little ridges that people buy to elevate their heels, whatever floats your boat. I insist on these parameters because I've seen people do plat squats with their knees out and their toes pointed out as well. That is not a plat squat. It's something different. It's just not a plat squat. If you want to learn the movement properly, Candido actually made a great tutorial. It's only five minutes long. That is Candido HQ training. You click on that video, you learn everything, you follow the cues, and you're going to be just fine. That lift is going to humble you like no other. You might have to cut the weight you normally use for back squats in half, but your quads are going to thank you because it is the most quad dominant squat variation in existence. The knees are going to travel all the way forward, the back is going to remain vertical, and your hips are going to remain internally rotated, which is going to reduce the recruitment and involvement of the posterior chain. So naturally, it goes into the plats tier. Now, talking about lifts that were named or created by legends, we have to discuss the frog. So the frog is a name that is only going to ring a bell for the OGs out there. It was created by Mike O'Hearn, as an all body machine routine circuit, whatever the fuck you want to call it. It's some overpriced plastic nonsense made in China that Mike Cohen managed to market for normies and sell to like old women in their 50s, telling it it was going to tone their glutes or whatever the fuck. It's a complete joke, of course, but I wanted to mention it because the incidence of machines that were created for an all inclusive purpose is not new. Chuck Norris himself came up with one such machine and times and times again they suck so it's going into the chicken tier. If you're going to dump 
thousands of dollars into a squat machine, you can do much better. But you should still be dodging the next entry, the leverage squat machine. And there are two types of them. There are the hack squats that go up and down, so they're completely useless because they just replicate what a squat would be without the freedom of placing the bar on your back. So I really don't see the point. Or, and this one is worse, it's those little pad things that people use and they lift up and they use for usually cabs. But that same machine is also marketed for quads. And let me tell you one thing. It's a death trap because if you fall a rep, it's going to bend you all the way forward like the IRS if you don't pay your taxes. And you can snap your lower back. I've seen some pretty severe injuries with that machine. So stay away from it. Use the Smith machine, use free weights, but don't use that. Whoever designed these two monstrosities should actually go to jail because making a machine that is worse than the free weight variation is truly a feat of stupidity unlike any other. So I'm placing the two of them in the mediocre tier. Truly, when it comes to squat machines, there is one true king, and it's the hack squat. You cannot go wrong with your hack squats, but you can still fuck it up, and there are certain variations that are just better. So, for example, to me, the reverse hack squat sort of defeats the purpose, because now you're going to be hinging at the hips a lot, because your hips are not actually resting on the pad, so they can travel backwards, meaning you're going to use much more lower back and glutes. We're talking about quads and the still is. So this is only really decent. So just be normal and do your squats with your back to the machine the way it was intended for. And if you do your hack squats in that fashion, it is an excellent lift. I was this close to putting it into the S tier, but you'll understand why I didn't. There is a big issue with that movement, with the strength curve in particular. And anyone who's used it knows already what I'm talking about there is a sticking point of the hack squat machine that is impossible to grind through. And just like in most squats, it's the moment where the hip joint aligns with the knee joint. The problem is that with a barbell, you can muscle your way through it. With the hack squat, you can't. You just die. There's no grinding through that sticking point. So it's tough to get to true failure. And that is due entirely to the fact that the hack squat is tilted. And the angle is great because it allows for more range of motion, but it also makes recruiting the quads at that key critical moment much more difficult. The good thing is that many people have figured that out, and just like with the leg press, they modified the strength curve by moving the placement of the weight. And the name of that beautiful machine is the Pendulum Hack Squat. I'm certain that you've heard people tout its benefits before. For once, it wasn't actually just for hype, it's not overrated. It truly is a beautiful invention, which is why I'm putting it into the Platz tier. If your gym has that machine, put your name on it, claim it for yourself, decapitate people who want to use it when you're in the gym, I don't know, but do everything in your power to have it accessible on your leg days because it has everything that you want in a quad exercise. It spares the lower back, the range of motion is immense and relevant because the, the quads are engaged throughout it and you can grind like a motherfucker, especially if you have a partner, because since the weight is not resting on top of you, you can have someone pull the weight to assist on the positive, and you can suffer and grind through the negative and really kill yourself. And I also find that it's fairly easy on the knee joint, which is not true for the next exercise on this list, which is the dumbbell leg extension. So the pendulum hack squat was a great idea by a great mind. But not everyone is gifted with possible thumbs because some of the inventions that people come up with make you question whether or not they are able to tie their shoes. And it goes for dumbbell leg extension. So someone somewhere sold the machine for leg extension and thought, you know what? I'm going to game the system. I'm escaping the matrix. I'm going to replicate the same movement with a dumbbell. That way I can do it at home or I don't have to wait for the machine. Great idea, Einstein. Now the strength curve sucks. It's not comfortable because good luck holding a heavy dumbbell in between your frail ankles. And on top of that, it's dangerous for your knees because the most amount of sheer force on the knee joint is now at the top of the movement. So it's everything that you do not want in a leg isolation movement. Please never do that movement. I'm going to put it in the chicken tier. There is a way to rig up some semblance of loops and lay on the bench and do it that way, but why would you go through the trouble when you can just do your leg extensions normally? Now, the next lift is sort of in the same category of what we call in French, les fausses bonnes idées, 
the false good ideas. It looks good on paper, then you do it and you're like, oh, it was actually fucking idiotic. And that is the Kang Squat. I'm certain that none of you have ever heard about that movement. I just want to include it because it's typically the type of variation that I know for a fact some joke off is going to pull out of their hats at some point or the other and claim that it's the best way to build quads, when in reality, it is completely useless. So the king squat is a hybrid of a good morning and a squat. Right there, you should have a question for me, which is why? But I ask again, why? What's the point? Why would you want to mix these two? A knee flexion and a hip hinge. We want to separate them as much as possible in bodybuilding so as to target the muscles that we want. So why do both? Well, the answer is because some people have too much time on their hands. You should not be doing that movement. I'm placing it as well in the mediocre tier. Pick a lane. Either do good mornings or do squats. The issue here is obvious. What load do you use? If you use a way that is going to be relevant for squats, you're going to destroy your lower back because you won't be able to good morning the weight up. And if you use a way that is relevant for good morning, you're never going to feel anything in your quads because it's going to be way too easy. Hybrid movements are never good for that reason. Now, the next entry on the list is not that bad of an idea, but it still has so many red flags that I still would like you guys to avoid it. And that is the Jefferson squat. So Jefferson squat is you're going to have the ball that's going to run in between your legs. You're going to grab it with a mixed grip or a normal grip, and you're going to squat it up and down. The issue here is obvious, the range of motion is shit, because the plates are going to run into the ground, even if you use 25s. So you're going to elevate yourself, but you'll still be running into the issue of your legs being awkwardly placed because your stance cannot be perfectly equal, it has to be staggered. Then there's also the fact that the upper body is also quote-unquote staggered, so you might develop imbalances, it's not comfortable. I really don't see why anyone would do these movements when hack squats exist. So I'm going to place these Jefferson squats into the B tier. The fact that the only illustration and demonstrations I could find of the movement were from pro bodybuilders on a ton of drugs using baby weights to get a pump in their quads also doesn't incline me towards liking that movement. So I prefer instead the hack squats I just described. But I'm not talking about the machine here. I'm talking about the barbell hack squat where the weight sits behind you, you grab onto it and you squat the weight up and down. Now we correct the issue of the staggered stance and the staggered upper body, but we still run into the issue of the range of motion because, if you, again, if you use small plates, the range of motion is not that great. I think that for the hack squat, we can forgive it for the simple reason that you will still begin and end the movement at a degree of 45. So you still are technically close to parallel, making the degree of involvement of your quads fairly high, if not maximized for the movement. Now, of course, you want to make extra sure you get a negative in. Please don't drop the bar. We're not doing a behind the back deadlift. The hack squat is a completely different lift. But a lot of silver era and golden era bodybuilders said that the hack squat was actually the reason for their massive quads. I also like the lift, so I'm going to place it in the excellent tier. And because the bar is behind the back, you also won't be loading the lumbar spine. So the spinal loading aspect is not that present. But is there maybe a way for us to increase the range of motion and the stretch on that movement? Well, actually, yes, there is. And this is when we connect back to what I said about the belt squat. So the issue with the belt squat was that the balance was poor. It was dangerous to get up and down with the weight dangling from your waist, etc., etc. What happens if instead the weight is either clipped to you or you hold on to it, well, it gives birth to what is known as the deficit sumo squat, which to me is to knee flexions what Romanian deadlifts are to hip hinges. Yes, these are big words of praise, but I truly believe that. So there are multiple ways to set that up. If you are in luck, you have a machine with a pit, meaning a machine that contains a clip that you can directly add onto your belt that runs directly from the floor and that you can load with a pin, which allows you to just overload the movement forever. And it's super safe because if you go to failure or if you want to end the set, you can just unclip, the clip just goes straight into the floor and you are perfectly safe. You can go down from the platforms. Or you could just hold a kettlebell, a dumbbell, or better yet, a barbell to be able to load the movement forever. The issue with the barbell being that you have to find a way to get it into your hands. So what I would recommend is get the two boxes close to a rack, 
set the pin to be able to grab the ball without actually bend, bending your back too much. And that should do the trick because that way you can also re-rack at the end of the set or just drop the barbell directly onto the floor. And the way this works is that now you're going to allow your feet to turn outwards entirely to allow for the bar and the weight to have some space to run into. And you're going to initiate the movement by maximizing knee flexion. This is of course going to recruit the quads. It's also going to recruit a lot of your glute muscles and adductors. And if you do slow negatives, you really won't need that much weight. And the reason why having your hips being maximally externally rotated is not an issue on that lift is that usually when you do squat with weight on your back, that position of the hip also induces more hip hinge and more back bend. So you end up recruiting more lumbar spine, which won't be a problem here because the weight is in front of you instead of being on top of you. So you can keep a perfectly vertical torso and you can also keep perfectly vertical shins. Which naturally leads to the following question. If deficit sumo squats are so good, what about sumo deadlifts? They should also be fairly high up in the tier list. And to that I say, fuck no. I'm going to place deficit sumo squats in the S tier, the plats tier. It's a bitch to set up, yes. But if you like it, you can make crazy gains with it. The sumo deadlifts, however, they're going into the chicken tier. Which shouldn't surprise anyone who actually takes a look at the specs of a lift. Yes, it's the same quote-unquote stance as with the deficit sumo squats. Even though your sumo squats should be done with a closed frog stance and not that super wide sumo stance. The difference is in what you do with the weight. Because the sumo deadlift for the most part is off the floor, so limited range of motion. It's positive only and it's a hip hinge. It still relies mostly on the musculature of the lower back and especially on the glutes. Why? Because you bend over to pick the bar. I insist on this because if you do your deficit sumo squats like you do a sumo deadlift, you defeat the purpose. You're not supposed to hip hinge into the movement. The knees initiate the movement. Go ahead and try to pick up a sumo deadlift by not bending at the hip. That bar will not move from the floor. Sumo pullers will tell you that. You need that extra energy of the floor, which doesn't entirely negate the recruitment of the quads. Because yes, sumo recruits more quads than conventional, but it's still complete garbage for hypertrophy because of the stimulus to fatigue ratio. And the same thing is also true for the trap bar deadlift. Uh, I've seen some EMG data that suggests that trap bar is a great workout for the quads. I call bullshit. I don't know a single natural bodybuilder who got big quads off of trap bar deadlift. It's still a deadlift. It's a hip hinge. It's good for the lower back, for the upper back, for the glute, but for the quads, not that great. Still, I'm going to put it in the C tier because it's always better than the sumo deadlift. But you should avoid these two movements if what you want is bigger legs. Now, if you're watching your screen right now, you are looking at this little sumo guy here and you wonder why I included him. Have you ever taken a look at a sumo wrestler's legs? They're fat, but they also have a tremendous amount of mass. Because when you weigh 400 pounds, you have to have very strong legs and glutes to be able to move all of that weight around and to be able to charge as fast as they charge. Keep in mind that the initial dash of a sumo wrestler is one of the fastest on earth. The amount of force they are able to create in that split second is immense, and that is because they train with shiko squat. A shiko is the stomping of the legs. It's the ritual of the legs. As a big sumo fan, I had to include it. So I'm going to put the shiko in the C tier. The issue being, of course, that it's a bodyweight movement. It's not scalable. You cannot progressively overload. And if you are not 300 pounds, you're not going to get much off of it because while well, the load is the weight of your body. And unless you are a sumo wrestler and you're literally willing to do shiko for hours every day because they do it for hours every single day, you would be better off just doing squats. And talking about squats, we have yet to mention the low bar. So I'm going to place it in the decent tier. I'm not a big low bar hater as long as you're not a complete asshole about it. I see some of these power lifters, they do what they have to do, God bless them, but dude, these are not squats. They're good mornings at best. There's almost, almost no deflection. If that makes them win medals, good for them. But as a bodybuilder, don't do that shit. The only exception for me would be if you are not physically able to do high bar squats and there are no replacements outside of just using a barbell. In which case, yeah, use a low bar stance. 
but the issue with the low bar stance is that as you understand it bends you forward there's more hip hinge there's more glutes there's more lower back and there is less recruitment of the quads and i know that some people argue that low bar squats are better than high bar because since you can use more weight it must mean you recruit more quads i'm not even going to comment on this level of stupidity because it is beneath me and the same could be said for the box squat so I also am not a big fan of people who tell novices to start with box squats to learn how to squat. Because to me, it's like telling someone to start benching with boards on their chest to learn how to bench. It makes no sense. If you want to accumulate range of motion, you can work on mobility via slab squats or via goblet squats. You don't have to use a box to just progressively overload your range of motion. But if you know what you're doing and you use a low box, and you use it properly, I think it can be a great tool. So I'm actually going to put it in the excellent tier. One, out of respect for Louis Simmons, may he rest in peace, but also because if you angle the box squat and you use the sharp edge and put it in between your legs and you actually sit back down onto it and use a low box, you can actually get a lot of quad engagement out of the lift and reduce the engagement of the posterior chain because it's going to allow you to remain much more vertical. What I don't want to see, however, is people who rock on the box. So it's people who do this. They go down with a vertical torso, then they sit, and when their glutes touch the box, they lean forward, and then they do this. So they rebound like that. This is complete nonsense. Now you're turning the box squat into a half good morning, half squat. You stay vertical. What goes down is your body in a straight line by bending at the knees, and then you initiate the movement by pushing off with your hips and with your glutes. That is how you box squat for bodybuilding. And you, of course, don't bounce off of the box. Use the box as a mean to pose and stretch the quads. So just like you would with a pose bench, you never actually rest the bar on your chest. You never actually sit on the box. You keep the tension on those quads. Now, with what I just said, the next entry might be a surprise. And actually, if you had told me that I was going to place this lift in the Platts tier and the S tier a year ago, I would have laughed in your face. That is the SSB squat. So for a long time, I believed that the issue with the SSB was that it bent you too much forward, so it recruited too much glutes, hips, and posterior chain, and it was a bad quad exercise. It wasn't until I realized that it is actually the best implement on earth to do post squats and stretch the quads like no other. The issue with post squats with a high bar is that your form will slowly break down, not because you are nearing failure, but because the position behind your body like this is unstable. So it starts to slowly degrade, and before you know it, you're more bent forward, there's less knee travel, the pose is slower, etc., etc. With the SSB bar, this doesn't happen because the bar is solidly wrapped around your upper body and neck and your upper back in particular, you hold on to it, so it's not going anywhere. Now, is it comfortable? Fuck no. It's the worst sensation on earth. It feels like someone is choking you from behind. But what you gain in stability in exchange for that comfort is immense. So if you can actually grind through that discomfort, you will find that you can really, really push your legs to failure with that motion. So as I said, it is going to go into the S tier. And you'll also get a decent amount of global stimulus from it, which is not true for the next entry, the rowing machine. It is, again, something that is marketed as a total body workout. And technically it is because you're going to use every single muscle to move back and forth. But the amount of stimulus you get for every muscle, especially the legs in particular, is almost non-existent. So you won't be growing from this. And I shit you not, I used to know people who would skip legs and say, oh, it's fine, I did some roar. And unsurprisingly, these people had chicken legs forever. So into the chicken tier, you go. And the attack bike also has to follow chicken tier as well. It's way too reliant on cardio. If your leg exercise has you dying for air before your quads can get any relevant amount of work, or if you rely on the burn that it gives you, you are never going to get big quads. It's simply not possible. But you won't have this problem with the next lift even if you are entirely out of shape because it is as close to isolation as one can get and that is the adductor machine so quickly for the people who still mistake the abductor and the adductor abduction is the action of moving the legs away from center mass so you open the legs it works the hips it works the glutes and adduction is the action of moving the legs within center mass. So you press with your knees onto pads and you close your legs together 
which trains the adductor, a muscle that, yes, does get work by every type of knee flexion, especially with a lot of outward rotation of the hips and your toes pointed outwards. But it can still be a good idea to isolate it for strength athletes, for performance, and also for bodybuilders, because any muscle you want to grow, you can isolate. The beauty of this being that it won't tax your lower back, it won't tax the rest of the quads, it won't tax the glutes. It is pure isolation for that muscle and for that reason, I'm going to place it in the excellence tier. The lift, just like the Smith machine, has a bad reputation because people make fun of it. Keep in mind that these are the same people who wear sweatpants to the gym because they're ashamed of the size of their legs. And the same can also be said for the next lift on this list, but for different reasons. Leg extensions get bad press because they have a reputation as knees destroyers. I'll tell you right now, if you hurt or snap your knees on leg extensions, it's because you're a complete idiot. The machine, unless it's just a bootleg from China, was created with in mind the idea that the sheer force on the knee at the top of the rep is as low as humanly possible and the stress is mostly present throughout the range of motion. So as long as you use proper loads and proper rep ranges, you should be absolutely fine. And just like with the adductor machine, the beauty of it is that it's a pure isolation for the quads. It won't tax your lower back, your glutes, it won't tax your armstrings, it's just pure quads. And if you look at the entirety of this list, it's one of the rare isolation movements out there that are present. So just for this reason alone, I'm going to place it in the plats tier. However, sometimes lifts have a bad reputation for a reason and we clown them because they are completely stupid. That is true for the Bozo Ball Squat. Why would you put yourself on an unstable surface when you do a heavy compound movement for the legs? There is absolutely no upsides to it. So chicken tier, because you understand that if you're going to have something heavy on your back and you have to actually focus on pushing the knees forward and recruiting the quads, the last thing you want is having to pay attention to balance, which also makes the overhead squat a bad option for bodybuilders. Because naturally, to keep that bar above you, you're going to have to have some degree of back bend. And unlike the front squats, which has its utility in bodybuilding, the amount of weight you can snatch and hold overhead as you squat is greatly limited in relation to what you can front squat with the front rack position. So I'm placing it in the mediocre tier. Again, unless you are literally competing in Olympic weightlifting, I don't see why anyone would do that lift. Or actually, no, I do know it's because there are coaches that tell people to master the overhead squat before they move to regular squats. It's the equivalent of telling someone to master how to sprint before they actually learn how to walk. It's completely dumb. And now we're going to end with our last two lifts of the day. The second to last being the Zuchu squat that I'm going to be placing in the decent tier. It's not great. It's not bad. It's just that if we're talking leg training, why would you hold the bar in this position? It is uncomfortable and it's going to pull you forward. So it's going to be tougher to actually stay upright. And if you don't have a rack at your disposition, you're going to have to pick the weight of the floor, which is going to recruit a ton of lower back and posterior chain, which we want to avoid. And now to conclude this list, we have the zombie squat. The zombie squat is a type of front squat where instead of holding onto the bar, you just extend your arms in front of you and you balance the weight atop your shoulders like this. I'm going just like the front squat to put it in the excellent tier. It has the strengths of its weaknesses, meaning that it's less technical, but it's also less stable. And this is going to conclude this video. So as you see, you have a nice lift of squat variations, isolations and exotic movements, which should give you plenty of options to decide what you want to do on your leg days. I really recommend you to not be too overzealous and to not pick a gazillion variations. Select your main style of squats, then one variation in line of specificity and spam them, get better, get volume, get stronger, and you will see results, I guarantee you that. And then you can bridge the volume gap by selecting movements that are going to be less fatiguing, more isolation types that you can use to develop the areas of the legs that your big squat style or big squat compound neglects. When you train legs, always remember that what is going to be the limiting factor a lot is going to be your lower back because actual loading takes a toll on the body. So always keep an eye on lumbar spine fatigue. There are plenty of movements in the list that don't tax the lower back at all. They will be your best friend in your journey because remember that it's good to train legs hard, but it's also important to train them often and it won't be possible if your lower back hurts every single week. 
Now, technically, we only have one tier list left, and that is the one for the Cavs. But because I'm not ready to say goodbye to this format yet, and also because I know that you guys greatly enjoy it, I'm going to postpone the release of that last episode. Instead, I'm going to be releasing four new tier lists that are still going to be in relation with bodybuilding, but centered around other themes. That will be a little surprise for you guys, so you can look forward to that. If you enjoy this tier list and you want to support my work, you can do so on my coffee page, you can do a donation, you can get a membership. The link is in the pinned comments. That's going to be it for today. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.